Diverse views on the need for health care reform are clashing in Wisconsin. Governor Jim Doyle made his proposal a while back for a plan that he says would provide coverage for up to 98% of the state's population. Well, I really hope that you're going to see the full legislature support my proposal. I mean, I, I live in a real world, and I really want to get real things done. The Democrats in the state Senate have pushed through a plan that they call Healthy Wisconsin. They say it will be more extensive than what the governor calls for. Because Wisconsin can't wait for the federal government to figure out what to do, absolutely the best solution is for it to, for health care reform to happen at the federal level. But it's simply not happening. There is no movement. In fact, we're seeing backward movement in terms of care of the poor and care of children that, that were previously covered by, by public programs. But the Republican-dominated assembly is resisting that. There are some who say we should let the free market dominate the medical marketplace. Do we head down a path towards socialized medicine, or do we instead unleash the power of consumerism and competition so that individuals will be in charge of their health care and not the government? This is Weighing the Issues of Healthy Wisconsin. I'm Wayne Sorge. And in the next two years, we can get some very important things done in this state. First, we can get all of our children insured. And through my Badger Care Plus proposal, we can make sure that people, all children have access to affordable health insurance. And second, we can help those families right now that are working at lower wage jobs and can't afford health insurance to be able to have a health insurance uh, product that can provide them basic insurance. It won't be a Cadillac coverage, but it will be, and they'll have to pay something for it, but it will at least be affordable. That's what I want to get done. We can have this whole big debate about should you redo the whole health care system or not, and I think most people are coming to the conclusion we should in some way, but while that debate goes on, I want to make sure we get our kids insured and we allow hard-working families that currently are earning too little to afford health insurance to be able to have a health, an affordable health insurance uh, policy. Even before the governor made his proposal on health care and before the Senate Democrats made their proposal for a more extensive plan, opposition was being aligned by the Wisconsin chapter of a national organization aimed at encouraging the free market. The organization is known as Americans for Prosperity, and they presented their ideas in a statewide webcast featuring their national leader and a Wisconsin legislator. Uh, when you look at the, the growth of government, one of the great cost drivers is health care. And one of the more frightening things I've seen in recent weeks was John Edwards, one of the tier one Democrat candidates, stand up and say, hey guys, we've got to have universal health care run by the government. And by the way, I'm going to raise your taxes to do it. And he's saying that before the election, okay? And that is something that, that ought to be frightening to us. It ought to tell us that we better start finding free market consumer-driven solutions to this issue of health care. As a nurse myself, I've taken pride in the care that I have given to my patients. I shudder at what it would be like to provide health care in a rationed system not to mention what it would be like to be on the receiving end as a patient receiving that care. Democratic State Senator Kathleen Weinhardt of Alma is one of the leading advocates of the Democratic plan that was approved by the Senate known as Healthy Wisconsin. The problems are grave in the state and we're looking to solve both the problem with those people who don't have insurance, people who have poor insurance, but also businesses and school districts and county boards, cities, farmers who can't afford the coverage that, that is out there because the costs are rising so fast. So we're looking to achieve both affordable coverage and coverage of those people who need it. One of the leading opponents of the Healthy Wisconsin proposal in the Assembly is State Representative Scott Souter of Abbotsford. It is really is a question of whether or not we're going to do a consumer-driven, market-based approach toward solving what ails health care in Wisconsin, um, or whether or not we're going to let the government take over our health care system. And while the Senate Democrats have inserted um, what they're calling a Healthy Wisconsin a Universal Health Care System program, um, which many of us have frankly called socialized medicine. Um, it would be a government-run 14.9% uh, payroll tax on every employer and every employee in the state of Wisconsin. And 
I just am not confident that putting the government in charge of an individual's health care, of everyone's health care in Wisconsin, is going to be the right uh, method uh, to reduce costs and keep quality the way it is. Dr. Thomas Chisholm is a retired Army physician who spends one day a week operating a free clinic here in the basement of the First Presbyterian Church of Chippewa Falls. It's, it's imperative that Wisconsin, if, no, if uh, individually, if not together with other states such as Massachusetts and California, institute a system that provides care for all our citizens and eventually this will, I hope, provoke a national system of health care that will provide care for everybody in the United States, just as care is provided for other countries in the world. As you see patients on a regular, if, uh, weekly basis, uh, what kind of need would you say Wisconsin has for that kind of a program? Wisconsin, it's imperative that Wisconsin provide care for those that I see. I see patients every Tuesday in what we call the Open Door Clinic in Chippewa Falls, a free clinic that we started in April of 2006. The uh, patients are uninsured, generally come from the lower social level of the uh, ordinary classes in Wisconsin are chronically ill, haven't had the care that would have prevented their conditions had they seen physicians or health care providers much earlier in, the, in their course. And as a result, the cost of providing care for them has increases substantially. Almost all have suffered from a, the great public health problems in the United States, which are essentially overeating, overindulgence in alcohol and drugs, smoking particularly and lack of exercise. These are all fundamental public health problems that uh, are being addressed nationally and have been discussed by the uh, by the American Medical Association, various specialties and the Institute of Medicine which uh, is available to anybody who wants to inquire about what they do on the internet that uh, uh, Institute of Medicine edu. How will this state program address some of the behavior issues that um, are kind of self-imposed um, ways of causing these health problems? Well, the system itself is in, can't address behavioral problems. Our social problems in, in the United States are poverty, lack of uh, adequate income from, uh, from job availability, but fundamental lack of education at the family and the, and the uh, primary school level. And it includes adequate uh, exposure to basic uh, needs that each one is responsible for and caring for themselves, eating correctly, and uh, brushing their teeth, seeing the dentist regularly, and uh, avoiding those uh, places where people always become involved in alcohol and tobacco. In fact, the patients that we see would never be in the healthcare system had they never taken up the habit of smoking or drinking. And of course the pervasion, the pervasive influence of uh, fast food chains certainly has something to do with the uh, obesity epidemic that is part of the problem. People overweight, grossly overweight, have hypertension, diabetes, arthritis, and uh, it leads to pain, the need to provide pharmaceuticals for their blood pressure control, to control their sugar, and uh, control the pain that they have in the joints that will ultimately require replacements because the destruction of their joints. So uh, the res teaching responsibility begins at home and at the earliest level in our primary education system. It's not just the duties of the medical profession 
itself. It begins with basic education at home, in the churches, and uh, in the schools. But the situation we find ourselves in currently is one that you feel like requires the state to get involved to make sure everyone can at least find the care they need for the situation they are in. There are, is a significant number of people in the, in the state of Wisconsin that are uninsured, not of their own volition. Insurance is increasingly costly each year. Employees, in, small employers in particular, they can't afford to provide insurance for their uh, employers, for their employees. And uh, self-employed people such as farmers and other small business people just simply ignore it. And then there are young people just out of school that uh, may not have jobs right away and so they just can't uh, pick up the cost the burden of of the ordinary uh, health insurance providers such as Blue Cross and Blue Shield. In Chippewa County, uh, recent statistics indicate that 10.7 percent do not have health insurance. And this, is, uh, this figure represents 6,000 county residents. People older than 65 have Medicare and they're almost always Covered. Those people less than 19 years old are provided through Badger Care and other government programs. But so many people without insurance with an acute situation appear at the emergency rooms at the hospitals throughout the state. Somehow that bill is paid, but in general it's either paid at 35% currently from my investigation may be paid by the patients themselves and the remaining 65% are either paid by a government program already or by increasing premiums for those people who do have insurance. Chris Loken is an Eau Claire insurance executive and is the president of the North and Central chapter of the Wisconsin Health Underwriters Association. As the representative of uh, our clients, which are employers, which are individuals um, who work for our clients in, 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 in particular with finding them uh, access to affordable coverage, finding if there's a government safety net type programs that are out there that are available for people, we, we are on the front lines of, of the issue. Um, is there a need in our state and in our country for some uh, changing of the way things are done? Certainly. Um, the hard part is, is that it seems that we always have the first thing that everybody wants to fix is really our, our financing mechanism. Um, and when we look at the costs of the financing mechanism of health care, it can range anywhere from 12 to, to 20 cents of, of, of the total health care dollar that's out there. Uh, all of the reform proposals that, whether it's Governor Doyle's, whether it has been the Healthy Wisconsin program, all basically point to fixing this, this small segment of the of the real problem the real problem is the 80 cents that we're spending on health care uh, or the 88 cents uh, that we're spending on health care somewhere in that range and very few of the proposals have real uh, innovative ways of reducing health care costs and the hard part about it is is that uh, health care costs are high, that makes insurance costs high, that makes affordability problems happen, that makes access problems happen. So we, but we seem to keep focusing on trying to fix the thing that sounds good and everybody goes, everybody gets this and everybody gets that and everybody gets this, but we, if we do not address the rising costs of health care, which there is a number of factors. Um, one of the most significant being the fact that government pays for 40 percent of the health care in our country today. Um, we These proposals will be uh, a temporary type of fix. They won't, they will not bring health care costs down. They will not, there will be affordability accesses in a, in a state-run program at that point in time. And once we've gone down that road, it will be very difficult to go back. Or 
we will, or what will happen is necessary services will be cut, or your, you know, your deductible will be high, or, or the, all of these different kinds of things. There will be some type of, of rationing um, uh, put into place. Judy Mosley is an advocate of the Healthy Wisconsin proposal through her responsibilities as the Western Organizer for Citizen Action Wisconsin. Well, because every day and every year that we don't do something and we wait for somebody else to do something, families are falling apart, they're going bankrupt due to medical costs, and sometimes people die because they don't have the medical care and the me medical coverage that they need. So I don't think we can afford to wait. Here at Eau Claire's Trinity Lutheran Church, the congregation is taking an interest in health care issues for their members as a whole, as well as individual Christians and citizens. The parish nurse is Marty Hoffer. Well, parish nursing is a fairly new field in the field of nursing. Uh, in the last 25 years, it has kind of come up. And um, what happens is that uh, a certain man, a certain doctor and a chaplain found that placing nurses in congregations was a really good way to connect um, and support people in times of health because that's another commonality we all have is our is our health and, and uh, you know how we manage that and so some of my responsibilities as a parish nurse include um, educating the congregation in the areas of health um, trying to trying to um, um, help them learn about the connection between faith and health um, supporting them through all walks of, of their health life and um, uh, a lot of it is connecting them with community resources that I've become familiar with so if they need help in the home, if they need help in a transition of uh, maybe leaving their home, I'm able to direct them to the right kinds of help. Often people don't think of um, people who are in need of health services who uh, may not be covered by insurance or something of that nature as not being the majority of your church members, um, but do you find people in your church or people who are touched by your church membership who have been affected by the difficulties that have faced a lot of people in finding and being able to obtain proper health care? Yeah, I think that problem has uh, certainly, we've seen it grow in big numbers over the last several years. It's a, it's a major crisis facing our nation now and I see um, issues with that in several of our membership. Um, some of the seniors who get to the point where maybe they're retired, they're living on a social security income, they need extra help in the home, they need extra care, their family's no longer nearby and they can't afford to get the help that they need. Um, that's where I think the church comes in, uh, our responsibility to our neighbors and to care for each other. Um, we often try to set up situations where we check on each other and can uh, care for each other, kind of like in a century ago when you would be surrounded by your, your church members in times of need. What about others that may be touched by uh, your church membership but may not be part of your church that may be facing some of these health problems? Uh, do you see responsibilities to uh, be concerned with their? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think our um, our care for our, our loved one and our faith community goes beyond our doors of our own church. We certainly need to care for the community and uh, the world around us. So that's definitely a focus of our ministry here at Trinity. With the current uh, discussions in the capital in Madison of what to do about health care. Uh, how has this congregation, Trinity Lutheran Church, been involved in at least paying attention to that issue? Well, um, interestingly enough, I took a short survey of my congregation this past May to determine some of their interests in educational things and what they would like to learn about coming up. And the number one thing that our congregation was interested in learning about was health care reform. So uh, we got a call from Senator Weinhelt's office to host this uh, public um, forum here and we were happy to do it because that certainly falls within our interests of um, health ministry and educating ourselves and the community about health issues. So 
that was kind of a perfect opening for us to, to have that forum here at Trinity. The, the answer is that the system is broke and everybody pays. If we only covered the additional uninsured, it would cost us more and continue to cost us more. We'd continue to have double digit inflation for everyone. What we need to do is get under the hood and figure out why costs are so high. We're all paying for the uninsured. We're all paying the high costs. We cannot address the problems of why there are uninsured until we address the whole system. That's why we've, I've said over and over again, we need fundamental change. That's the image of the boat. We're all in this together. We're looking at the uninsured, if you think of the Titanic, as the people on the third deck. The people on the top deck are still rearranging the chairs thinking they're not going to sink. But let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, this ship is sinking and we need to do something about the ship. And the problem is a lot of the passengers find themselves switching decks. We, we for years, have treated, or I should say certain people in power, have treated the uninsured as the great unwashed. Well, it must be their fault that they're uninsured. They must have done something wrong. Thank goodness I've got coverage as a hardworking person. And then one day you discover that lump. Or you didn't ask somebody to hit you with their car, but they did. And something happened. Now you've got these pre-existing conditions that make it nearly impossible to get coverage if you ever switch jobs or try to chase another policy. So the fact of the matter is there isn't just one class of uninsured people. Every one of us, it seems, is that close to losing the coverage we have now. So it's not about just covering one particular group of people. But if you look at that particular group of people, as Kathleen said, we are paying for that care already. One of the criticisms of Healthy Wisconsin, for example, was, well, if there are undocumented workers here, you know, why, why are we covering them? We're covering them now. When something happens, they're working as immigrant labor on a farm or in a factory, and something goes wrong, they go to the ER. They don't pay the bill. The hospital has bad debt. Under Healthy Wisconsin, if you get a paycheck, you are paying part of the assessment, and you have coverage. So they're paying into the system, they're covered. Hospitals and clinics don't have the bad debt anymore. So we've tried to address this on many different levels. Parish nurse Hoffer sees health needs in Wisconsin that need to be studied and addressed. Well, I'm just thrilled to see the issue being brought to light, that the opportunity for everybody to become more educated about it and um, just plans coming forward to, to address this issue that is certainly a crisis for everyone in our nation. Um, whether you're for the plan or against the plan, I think this is a, a great opportunity for uh, us to learn more and to be able to verbalize our concerns. For Christians in her congregation and outside it, Hoffer believes health care is an appropriate concern. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think um, as a Christians we have Jesus as our role model who held a healing ministry all his life in the way that he cared for people. And um, we certainly see that as our role as well as Christians. And not only caring for others, but caring for ourselves. And what does that mean in the picture of our lives and um, as being stewards of our, our health and our bodies and how we care for others. So definitely fits in with our with our uh, mentality here. And you have a committee here as well as the congregation at large being involved in the uh, hearing that was held about the Healthy Wisconsin proposal. Do you feel like this church is set on a path to be involved in these kinds of issues? Um, yes, I do have a, a committee, a health ministry committee that supports my role as a parish nurse here and also um, we work on different kind of program offerings that are happening here in the church and uh, certainly would like to see us involved in this kind of thing in the future as well. Um, it's definitely an issue that needs to be addressed and um, I'm, I'm happy that we're involved in, in this. Do you see it having meaning for the individual Christian or church member as well as the congregation as a whole and society as a whole also uh, something that you you hope that uh, we as a, as a state and as a culture um, can deal with positively now? Oh, I, I think it's vital that we have to become involved in it, um, especially even down to the personal level. Yeah, our, health, our health in general has 
also taken a downward turn when people are not um, taking responsibility for themselves and and that's um, that's one of our definitely things that we need to do and it affects our it affects our population affects our society in general so certainly this is our responsibility some people uh, like the plans that they've had for years they may have been covered by their employer uh, or their employer may have covered much of their cost and they may feel like leave well enough alone well it's kind of like somebody being on the top deck of the titanic as it's going down and they keep saying i'm okay i'm okay don't worry about me i'm all right but sooner or later the health care crisis that our country is in right now is going to affect everybody. I'm really glad that there are some people out there that have great, wonderful plans for which they pay nothing, but that's not the vast majority of us. So we still need change. Um, and you know what? Those people who have great plans now are most likely represented by a union who will be able to negotiate them very, very similar coverage to what they have now. They're not going to be worse off under Healthy Wisconsin. Everybody else is going to be better off and more like them. What's going to happen under this proposal to companies that are, as they see it, taking care of their employees? Uh, companies that are currently taking care of their employees and paying for their health insurance are absolutely going to love this plan. They are going to thrive under it because it's going to drastically cut their costs and their out-of-pocket expenses. It's going to allow them to pay more attention to the nuts and bolts and perhaps expanding their business rather than what a big bite they're taking for health insurance right now. Some of them may feel like the... Uh program that they are offering their employees currently is giving them an advantage in hiring good people and that if everybody's on an even playing field they won't have that advantage well you know it it's hard for me to accept the idea that g a level playing field is a bad thing um, I, I really do think that the current cost of health care is becoming so difficult for companies to be able to absorb that they're ready for that change, that, that it doesn't bother them that that's going to level the playing field because the advantage to them is going to be big enough. I have not yet heard any business owners saying, gee, um, it's, it's going to make my competition in a, in a better – I'd rather pay the enormous cost that I'm paying now. Thank you very much. Of course, much of the negative reaction has been based on cost and the expansion of state government that uh, they perceive as being um, – going out of hand in this proposal. Uh, is, is this going to break the state financially and, and uh, put the state's businesses that are participating in this at a disadvantage to those they compete with in other states? I, I think, well, there's two different questions there, but I think that um, as one of the attractive things about this program is that it is not this big social welfare program, that um, it it is not the state providing health care. It is not the state providing even health care insurance. What it is is it's the state collecting the money and making the pool and and keeping that playing field level for everybody. So it puts the state in more of a, a negotiation and enforcement role rather than creating some enormous state agency. Um, it, it really is a nice compromise in, in that manner. I think as far as um, businesses feeling competition with out-of-state businesses, um, I do think that it's going to be a reason for businesses to be attracted to Wisconsin and to come to Wisconsin. Providing employee health benefits is such an enormous burden to businesses now that I, I do think that, that for most businesses, certainly not all of them, but for most, that is going to attract them to the state, and it will give Wisconsin business owners a competitive edge against, say, um, you know, Ohio or, or Pennsylvania or other states. 
What would you say to people who think the federal government is going to address this and we should just wait until that happens? I think that a snowball's chance in hell has just about as good a chance of happening real soon. Um, Unfortunately, uh, things moving on the federal level are very, very slow, takes many years, sometimes decades. We've seen you know, 20, 25 years passed since the last major health care reform proposal. And um, we still find that our federal legislators aren't willing to push that envelope yet. Uh, I don't see that, that anything is going to happen on a federal level for some time. Now, I hope that different states like the state of Wisconsin coming out with a plan and having it work and be successful, I hope that that's going to spur national reform. I hope that on a national level they'll take a look and say, hey, gee, there are some states that are doing great things. We should do that across the nation. Um, But I think we have to give up on the idea of waiting for the feds to take care of this for us. Do you believe that Wisconsin can be an example to the nation? I hope so. We have such a long tradition of progressive reform and really coming up with creative new ideas for making a positive impact on people's lives. And I think this can be a 2007 example of that progressive reform. But if the program is established in Wisconsin and all of the systems are put into place to make it work, what will happen to those systems once uh, the federal government decides to take it over? Uh, Well, then I would assume it would become the federal government's headache. Actually, what's most likely to happen if, say, 10 years down the line, um, the, the movement for national reform was so strong that the federal government decided they had to do something and put in a program they would most likely do it state by state and mandate that states set up a program like this. We'd be ahead of the game. We would have already ironed out all the kinks. We would already have, you know, all of those little things that you've got to tweak and change in order to make it work for your state. We'd have it done already. Um, I agree, and many of us agree, we should, our goal should be to cover all children in Wisconsin and make sure that that's the first step to making certain that you know, we have do the right thing for health care in Wisconsin. Uh, but a 14.9% payroll tax um, as a beginning, as a floor, um, that will cost $15.2 billion a year. Um, and again, that's just the start. Uh, I think that's a dangerous experiment. One, I don't believe it should be in the state budget. Um, it only had one very small public hearing the day before it was inserted into the state Senate Democrats' budget. I don't believe it belongs there. I believe that's more about politics than it is about truly good public policy. If we're going to do this, this deserves widespread public debate uh, throughout the state of Wisconsin with all of the stakeholders at the table. Um, It's simply not good enough to throw it into a 1,600-page state budget document and um, call it a day. Uh, This really, if we're going to overhaul, completely overhaul, and completely change the way we do health care in Wisconsin um, and have an unelected board being able to make not only those decisions in terms of which doctor you go to um, and what type of health care you receive, but also having taxing authority um, that could raise as much as 6% per year, um, 14.9% payroll tax. So um, really, uh, and the Taxpayers Alliance itself, the Wisconsin Taxpayers Alliance, very nonpartisan group, um, usually on the mark when it comes to fiscal matters, uh, they said it, that by 2017, we could be $4.5 billion short in terms of how we fund this system, the socialized medicine scheme, and it would end up costing about $32 billion per year at that time. Uh, that, that's, a, a, that's half the state budget uh, per year, uh, and this $15.2 billion tax increase on employers and employees, uh, I really don't think is the right way for Wisconsin to go with regard to health care. I believe it will reduce quality. I believe it will reduce access. I believe it will chase Wisconsin businesses out of the state of Wisconsin um, and, frankly, prevent businesses uh, from coming here. I believe it's truly a job killer. Still, it's a rare state that is considering such a thing. Uh, Does this put the people and the businesses in the state of Wisconsin at a disadvantage competitively with those in other states if this is enacted with the costs associated with it? 
Actually, there are many other states that are considering health care reform. And what I would say about what Wisconsin is doing is that, that we're showing leadership in the entire country by not only covering those who don't currently have coverage, but also dealing with the underlying problems of why costs are rising. If we can get a handle on why costs are rising so fast, if we can get to the heart of controlling costs, what we're able to do then is have predictable costs for business. So I would argue just the opposite, that not only do we provide health care coverage to our citizens, but Wisconsin could actually become a magnet for other businesses who could seek both affordable costs and a healthy workforce by coming to Wisconsin. What would you say to people who may have jobs that provide health care? Uh, some of them may have to pay part of it, but some of them may not even pay any of it and feel like, they're doing fine, uh, why should my tax dollars uh, have to be used to expand coverage for others? Well, actually, the tax dollars are not being used. The dollars that are being used are the same dollars that are being paid into the system, but we're collecting them in a little bit different way, and we're handling risk in a different way. And w what we have is a system that it may benefit some, but in the long run, it's unsustainable for everyone. We, for example, here in Eau Claire, looked at um, the the city is looking at a 57 percent increase in its health care costs. We all pay for that. And in addition, the uninsured people um, provide, when we provide coverage to those people through our own premiums, we all pay for that in increased health care costs. So you could say that there are some people that are doing fine, but that's looking at it at a very small level, at the level of you or I. It's not looking at it at the big picture level. And any one of us could be one day away from losing our health insurance because we lost our job or from coming up with a chronic disease that we never expected to have but that made us uninsurable. So yes, there are some people that are doing quite well, but we need to resolve the problems in the whole system and in that way all of us will be doing much better. And while there are things we can do for market-based, consumer-driven approaches um, to make certain that we have one transparency so people know what they're paying for, so we can have health care savings accounts, which will be a component of helping with health care, um, to make sure our health care our premiums are tax deductible. I think that's something that many of us can agree on. And I think we need to make certain we continue with wellness programs and continue um, with not only tax credits, but programs that encourage people to um, stay well and have an active lifestyle, and a lifestyle that prevents um, certain types of diseases and prevents um, illness uh, from the outset, and also preventative care for children. I'm a big fan of Badger Care, very big fan of Senior Care. I think programs like that work. But having the government completely in charge of health care uh, here in the state of Wisconsin and having an unelected board being able to make those taxing decisions uh, on employers, on employees, uh, on businesses, uh, and small employers, I just don't think is one workable and two I think it's very very risky both for our economy and for our health care I think you think you're gonna find health care professionals if this plan were to go through and many of us are fighting it including myself what I think will happen is you'll have health care professionals leaving the state of Wisconsin and businesses leaving the state of Wisconsin um, this is a that has been criticized uh, by the Wall Street Journal by um, if you saw the John Stossel report recently just it, completely um, unveiled how bad this plan truly is. And they actually said, why don't you go ahead and try it? It'll be an example for the rest of the nation of why we shouldn't go uh, in this direction. Um, if you look at Canada and France, those systems that had uh, universal health care systems, they are now moving back toward private health care systems. Um, they actually have a dual system in many of those countries. So it, while other countries who have already tried this experiment are moving toward a private system, um, I'm not sure why Wisconsin wouldn't want to move in the direction of a socialized medicine scheme that really hasn't um, been thought out, really hasn't had adequate public hearings, and certainly hasn't had adequate public debate. Um, people really don't know what's in this plan. But I will say a few things that I'm very concerned about that are in um, this plan that the state Senate Democrats have tried or have inserted in their version of the state budget. Not sure uh, many people will agree that this plan um, that's responsible to include illegal aliens. Illegal aliens would be covered under this plan. 
I believe that would create a, a flock of individuals from other states and other countries coming to Wisconsin to receive free health care. Um, there's a huge question of whether or not we should cover whichever, other, ever, whichever side of the debate you're on, why would this plan cover abortions? Um, you know, whether you're pro-life or pro-choice, uh, why should taxpayers have to fund that through this plan? And it is in the state de Democrats' plan. Why does the teachers' union get a pass um, on this plan? Why are they exempt? There's really no reason one powerful special interest group should be exempt from this plan and it's written into the bill. Um, so there's a number of problems with the bill. Um, I'm sure that the authors will say, well, we've got to try something. I would say um, this is too risky, too costly, shouldn't, doesn't belong in a state budget. Sure, we can talk about it, uh, but it has too many problems right now um, for us to simply take a risk and go forward. I think it would be bad for the economy, bad for our health care system. And I don't believe taxpayers want another payroll tax on top of all the taxes that they already pay. And they don't want government in charge of their health care. As you see patients on a regular, if, uh, weekly basis, uh, what kind of need would you say Wisconsin has for that kind of a program? Uh, Wisconsin, it's imperative that Wisconsin provide care for those that I see. I see patients every Tuesday in what we call the Open Door Clinic in Chippewa Falls, a free clinic that we started in April of 2006. The uh, patients are uninsured, generally come from the lower social level of the uh, ordinary classes in Wisconsin, uh, free, are chronically ill, haven't had uh, care that would have prevented their conditions had they seen physicians or health care providers much earlier in, the, in their course. And as a result, the cost of providing care for them has increases substantially. Almost all have suffered from a, the great public health problems in the United States, which are essentially overeating, overindulgence in alcohol and drugs, smoking particularly and lack of exercise. These are all fundamental public health problems that uh, are being addressed nationally and have been discussed by the, uh, by the American Medical Association, various specialties, and the Institute of Medicine, which uh, is available to anybody who wants to inquire about what they do on the Internet that uh, uh, Institute of Medicine edu. So this figure that the governor put out of insuring 98% of the citizens and the proposal from the uh, Democrats in the Senate to do better than that, you don't see as accomplishing what they say it will. Well, you know, with the, in the governor's proposal, it is really a um, an expansion of a government program already. Um, we've, it's well documented, whether it be um, uh, in our dental, our dental providers uh, out there that are, that don't take Medicaid patients because they, they get, they get an exorbitantly low number uh, in terms of the, of providing that treatment to those people. It's not that they don't want to provide it, it's just that they couldn't stay in business doing that. Um, uh, that's that's one example. In the government programs, the reimbursement levels back to our providers have been historically, by nature, low. If we continue to expand government programs, we basically have, um, and we have lower rates. So if we get a, if we get eighty cents on the dollar when we give out a dollar's worth of care, the the pro medical provider is taking a twenty cent loss on that. What happens is, is that shifts to those who have private insurance and those who um, they pay for their health care out of their own pocket. And that's in the form of higher rates, and that's really where um, the expansion of government programs can, can only add to the, to the affordability and access issues that we're having right now. So. So putting these steps into effect, whether we go with the governor's proposal or the one in the Senate, uh, are we going to have some consequences as far as um, doctors leaving the state or hospitals closing or clinics closing or things like that? Or would that be 
uh, overreacting? I think if we look at it in the in the initial context, we say, okay, the next year is is this hospital going to close or things like that. Uh, one thing that does not seem to be put out a lot in the Senate proposal on uh, on health care reform is is that they're going to go into every provider in this state and they're going to t- ask for a 40 percent reduction in rates. Um, there is not. 40 if there was 40 percent reduction in rates there would be there would have the market would have allowed that to happen there are uh, in private insurance companies go and negotiate rates with providers and there are very few that have a 40 percent discounted rates what what will happen if they are successful in getting that 40 percent reduction in rates it is very difficult to understand um, where where will they where will they find that money? Um, that is a question that we're still trying to answer you know, as we kind of sift through the details of this program. The, the hard part is, is it seems always that in, in, when we think about how health care is delivered in this country, um, they'll take resources away from prevention and wellness care. <laughs> they, won't take the resor- they won't take the resources away from the critical and the emergency care. We're very, very good as a nation at fixing problems. We're not as very good as a nation at preventing uh, having chronic health care issues. With so much attention being focused on it as a national issue, uh, why is it being addressed mostly by the Democrats in the Senate as a proposal for the state? The answer is because Wisconsin can't wait for the federal government to figure out what to do. Absolutely, the best solution is for it to, for health care reform to happen at the federal level, but it's simply not happening. There is no movement. In fact, we're seeing backward movement in terms of care of the poor and care of children that, that were previously covered by, by public programs. The problems are grave in the state, and we're looking to solve both the problem with those people who don't have insurance, people who have poor insurance, but also businesses and school districts and county boards, cities, farmers who can't afford the coverage that that is out there because the costs are rising so fast. So we're looking to achieve both affordable coverage and coverage of those people who need it. Still, it's a rare state that is considering such a thing. Uh, Does this put the people and the businesses in the state of Wisconsin at a disadvantage competitively with those in other states if this is enacted with the costs associated with it? Actually, there are many other states that are considering health care reform. And what I would say about what Wisconsin is doing is that, that we're showing leadership in the entire country by not only covering those who don't currently have coverage, but also dealing with the underlying problems of why costs are rising. If we can get a handle on why costs are rising so fast, if we can get to the heart of controlling costs, What we're able to do then is have predictable costs for business. So I would argue just the opposite, that not only do we provide health care coverage to our citizens, but Wisconsin could actually become a magnet for other businesses who could seek both affordable costs and a healthy workforce by coming to Wisconsin. What would you say to people who may have jobs that provide health care? Some of them may have to pay part of it, but some of them may not even pay any of it and feel like they're doing fine, Uh, why should my tax dollars uh, have to be used to expand coverage for others? Well, actually, the tax dollars are not being used. The dollars that are being used are the same dollars that are being paid into the system, but we're collecting them in a little bit different way, and we're handling risk in a different way. And what we have is a system that It may benefit some, but in the long run, it's unsustainable for everyone. We, for example, here in Eau Claire, looked at um, the the city is looking at a 57% increase in its health care costs. We all pay for that. And in addition, the uninsured people um, provide, when we provide coverage to those people through our own premiums, we all pay for that in increased health care costs. So you could say that there are some people that are doing fine, but that's looking at it at a very small level, at the level of you or I. It's not looking at it at the big picture level. And any one of us could be one 
one day away from losing our health insurance because we lost our job or from coming up with a chronic disease that we never expected to have but that made us uninsurable. So, yes, there are some people that are doing quite well, but we need to resolve the problems in the whole system, and in that way, all of us will be doing much better. We keep hearing about how, compared to other nations, our health care system has fallen in various ratings. Um, whose fault is that? Well, I think there's a lot of I think there's a lot of reasons whose fault it is. I think if we look at the ratings that are always traditionally used, which are the uh, World Health Organization, and we're 37th in the in the world in 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 our healthcare system, the hard part is is that they look at two different statistics in there. The one they heavily are weighted towards infant mortality, and they're also heavily weighted towards life expectancy. In the United States, um, the number of uh, babies that are uh, less than 14 ounces who are who are actually alive today is a is in a I mean thousands of percent higher than it is in Canada, France, Great Britain, um, and but the problem is is when those countries report those statistics, they don't even count babies who are 14 ounces or less when they're born because in those countries they don't thing to um, those basically those babies have a chance to grow up so that's a very weighted statistic that makes us look not so good um, the the other aspect is the life expectancy and really our life expectancy is there's a number of reasons but one of the largest reasons behind our life expectancy is the way that we take care of ourselves we are a nation that wants a quick fix all the time. We do not want to, when the doctor says you're borderline high blood pressure, we would rather take the medication than go out, lose the 10, 20 pounds, have a, have a few less, uh, have a few less uh, beers and cocktails a month, a few little less salty foods, and just watch your diet and, and, get, and get the exercise that we need. Uh, in, in other nations, there is a tremendous focus on preventative and wellness care. As we said before, the incentives in our system are misaligned to that. We don't, uh, you know, it, it's kind of more of a sick care system in our country versus a health care system. So those, those statistics kind of uh, are, uh, are always, uh, you know, they don't necessarily take into account all of those factors. Um, but you know, we still have uh, amazing things done in our medical system. When people who can buy any health care in the world buy health care, uh, you know, they're coming to places like the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Uh, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the, the very big oil uh, folks out of the Middle East, when they need a procedure done, they come to Rochester. They're not moving. They're not going to Canada. They're not going to Great Britain. They're not going to France. Um, we have some of the best technology. We are on the cutting edge of a lot of different things. We have tremendous talent and tremendous firepower in our medical system. The hard part is, uh, and people get great care here. The hard part is, is that it, the way that we've used it for a long time, the way we've been financially motivated to use it for a long time has has kind of allowed it to get to this point we have truly have the ability whether it be in the state of Wisconsin because we have some of the best medical minds in this state we have some of the best financing and 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 health care minds in this state uh, we have the we have the power to do something uh, very unique however I we need to first step in that is just quit trying to wave a magic wand. So, when it comes to the insurance industry, do you feel like you're in a squeeze by market conditions currently, or are you threatened with being squeezed out of existence or into a minimal existence by some of the reform ideas? Um, there are there are certainly. Um, parts of uh, a lot of the reform proposals that want to get rid of the private insurance market. Um, the hard part is is that nobody 
remembers that in the state of Wisconsin, uh, we have about 93% of our population is insured, whether it be in the in public programs or through the private insurance market. That is still in the top five in the nation in terms of the uninsured out there. Our 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 folks, the agents and the people out there are doing a, are doing a good job. It's uh, and the hard part about it is is that it won't. We always can look like we're going to be uh, self-serving, uh, but we are the experts in the field. We are the people who are working every day to get those accessibility and affordability issues down, and we play a very valuable role. Uh, you know, if you've looked at, there's a lot of stories about this company denying coverage or things happening where people have had not had an advocate out there in the system for them. And that's really what the role of the health insurance agent is, whether it's an employer client, whether it's an individual employee, one of our employer clients, whether it's an individual who's struggling in the system, finding a way to make sure that the companies that we represent are taking care of the people in the way that they promised. That's, that's what we do. And so uh, leaving us out of the picture, we feel, is a, uh, would, 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 would really hurt people in the long run. If you're having to, to work with a, uh, whether it be a state committee board of people who, you know, to get something covered or whether it be um, having to deal with somebody in bureaucracy to get something covered, certainly it is not a, uh, certainly is not as good as somebody who's working in your best interests and has uh, something to do with that. Uh, we know that there needs to be change uh, out there. We are, we're the ones that have been probably talking about that for the longest time. But we're the people who are bringing the options to the table that are helping employers. We have, uh, you know, in talking with a lot of our members, we've actually, in a lot of cases, been reducing people's health insurance premiums through the uses of getting creative, saying, okay, here's the amount we're spending on health insurance now. What could we do with a health savings account? What could we do? How much would your premium go down if you made a change to this carrier or that carrier? And really working through those options, finding those carriers that are going to be a good partner for, with you when, when, when everything is, is great and everybody's healthy and everything's going well, but also finding those insurance companies that it will be there if something does come up um, and, and they're there to, to follow through on the promises. And we've really seen I've been running some numbers on some of the reform proposals based upon the payroll taxes and things like that. In in most of every uh, client that I have, um, and I'm talking with some other agents, every client that they have, these programs are actually going to start off costing a lot of our clients more. Um, and while they may get a little bit more in terms of benefits in the first year or so, uh, health care costs in this country are still rising at about a uh, percent a month. That's 12 percent a year. None of those programs are doing anything to address that rising cost of health care. And it, it, what, will, what, will, what will the future look like is really the big question. And that's what we do is we try to say what will the future look like and how can we help you get to a, uh, a much more positive future. And are you predicting that if Healthy Wisconsin is passed or if the governor's proposal is passed, things will continue to get worse? I think that would be a very gloom and doom uh, view of, of either of the reform proposals. However, it, it, it's, it's all about the health care costs. If we do nothing to control health care costs, we will not, it won't be a government solution that's going to work. It won't be a private market solution that's going to work. There will be no solution. And the only way that will, um, only problem that will happen is, is that there will be, uh, there could be rationing. There could be in the future uh, providers looking to, to cut back in terms of the uh, services that they can provide or the research and the technology that they can provide. And then everybody will not benefit from that. Um, and that is a very, uh, very scary 
thought um, uh, in, in, in especially here in the Chippewa Valley because we have access to some very world-class health care resources. Some advocates of the Healthy Wisconsin Plan say it could be a model for the rest of the country. I would not necessarily, I think that the model is flawed. Uh, we think that the model has some flaws in it. Um, it's based upon the state employee's health plan. Uh, the state employee's health plan, um, uh, under the structure that it operates, which is a, a very large group of people, um, does not operate at the costs that they are, um, they are showing in the Healthy Wisconsin proposal. Um, it's about another uh, two or three or four hundred dollars depending upon the type of coverage per person that's covered under that program. Uh, that, um, that really struggle, I struggle with that being a, a model not only for the state of Wisconsin but also for the rest of the country because it does not, again, it does not address very well the costs of health care. You see any potential for a good plan being approved? The only way that a good plan that will work for everyone is going to come together is for the forces in Madison to quit attempting to take sides and start getting all of the stakeholders in the room whether we whether there are people on certain sides that agree with uh, the private market side of things uh, whether there are people on the other side of the aisle that don't that don't agree with the government side of things the key is getting every and and the medical providers getting them in the room getting the people with the pharmaceutical industry uh, getting in the middle of the room that's where our potential lies getting all of the stakeholders involved and, and saying, okay, give a little piece here, give a little piece there, um, but we all end up doing what we do for the good of the people. And that's, that's what our system is based on. Uh, our, our political system isn't based upon, hey, we won an election, so now we can run everything down everybody's throat. Uh, that is not what our political system is based on. Our system is based upon compromise. Uh, open debate, discussion, acknowledgement of others' viewpoints. But if I don't agree with one person, or, or if I don't agree with somebody on on 75% of it, I can agree with them on this 25% of something, or vice versa. And we do the political climate is not very good right now for that in, in Madison. Um, and our our legislators need to be working harder to foster that. <coughs> Um, because that's the only way we're going to come to something that's going to work for everybody. As long as the prices, the costs of medical care keep escalating, as you have mentioned, somebody's making money off of the deal as it is now. Isn't that a disincentive to reform? I, you know, the hard part is is that there are uh, there's a lot of uh, talk about that, and and I think there needs to be more disclosure about what where what are these profits where are these profits coming from you know are and that's I think that's part of this that's part of this discussion um, you know a lot of our insurance companies that we work with you know if they can you know their their private business if one percent is a good year in a health insurance company as far as a profit margin um, so, so your industry isn't a bunch of profiteers. There are people, there are companies in this, in the insurance industry uh, that have made some very good profits. Um, but some of them, uh, you need to look at, they're, they're very diverse businesses. They do a lot of other things. Uh, they do claims paying for the governmental entities. They do a number, they, 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 um, they use some of their technology and they they sell it to other people there's there's different things that they do that can make their profits go up significantly when you start looking at the cost of uh, here's the amount of money we had to come into the insurance aspect of it here's the money we paid out those profits are are certainly a lot lighter 
are there certainly some some areas that need to be explored and do we as as consumers out there need some answers on some things well, certainly but uh, in most cases you know the one to two to three percent is a is a good year in in the insurance company side now I don't represent insurance companies I represent employers and and individuals who 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 are my clients who need health insurance um, so you know that you may be better off talking with them a little bit but that's uh, but again all of those things being put on the table and all of those discussions being put on the table will get us to uh, an end that that I think would work for everyone uh, we know that the system is not sustainable now we we also know that just fixing one portion and expecting it to become sustainable is a is a is a, is a very uh, a very long reach one of the things that has been said quite a bit on the internet and elsewhere since this was introduced was that it was going to be a major tax increase for the state of Wisconsin compared to history and compared to other states the increase is related to what we're paying now. We're not talking about a tax increase. We're talking about taking the dollars that we're now bringing into the system and actually paying in less into the system. The money is not going into the state coffers. It's not a tax. It's an assessment. The money is actually going into a private um, uh, trust that would administer the program. The people who are the people whose money it is are the people who would make the decisions about how the money would be paid for. So the trustees would represent those people who now pay into the system, business people, both small and large, workers, self-employed people, um, farmers, consumers. These are the people that would make up the trust, that would make the decisions about how the money would be spent. That the people would follow a system that changes the rules. It changes the way that we deliver health care by changing the way we pay for health care. Doctors and hospitals would remain the same. They would still be private organizations. They would be paid, depending on how they were organized, they would either be paid on a per person rate or by the number of services they provided. But in each case, there would be an incentive to provide high quality care, to consider the cost, and to focus on keeping people healthy rather than taking care of people who were sick and, and increasing the number of services to those people who were sick that maybe were unnecessary. And what's going to be the uh, nuts and bolts of how this will work for those who have no coverage now? Maybe they work for a job that provides no insurance, or maybe they're unemployed, uh, these types of people. Well, the Healthy Wisconsin, your choice, your plan, provides care to those people who are in the middle, the people who are not eligible for any public program, whether it be Medicaid or Medicare. So a person that has no income at all or very, very low income would likely be eligible for Medicaid or Badger Care. So those people would be in the public program. They wouldn't be in the, in, in the Healthy Wisconsin program. But the people in the middle, the people that were not covered, they would have the same benefits that I have as a state legislator. They would have a choice of plans, which is the way it works for me as a state legislator. That choice would be unrelated to what to their particular job. So if they were in a job right now where the employer didn't pay into the system, that employer would have to pay into the system. But the, all of the people who are now employers buying insurance would no longer have to worry about negotiating with insurance companies. Instead, they would play, pay a rate based on a percent of payroll. For that employer, it would be 10.5% of payroll. For the worker, it would be 4% of payroll. This would be done through a payroll deduction. As I mentioned, it's not a tax. It's an assessment. It doesn't move into the state budget. It moves into the trust, and the trust then pays doctors and hospitals through the system similar to the way they're being paid now. Those people who are in jobs that are not now providing coverage are mostly people in low-wage jobs in both the service and retail industry. So what, what we would see is uh, the ability for these low-wage employers to provide health insurance at, at a much less cost than they have now. And for me, as a former farmer, I, I very much wanted to provide health insurance to my employees and, and to my family, but eventually for my family it became un, unaffordable. So what we would 
many of those low-wage employers that are not now covering their employees would find that the insurance would be quite affordable. There have been some cases in other types of insurance where insurance companies didn't like the guidelines they had to operate under in certain states, and they just pulled out of those states. Could that happen as a result of this proposal for how they would operate for health insurance in Wisconsin? Certainly, absolutely. No one is keeping any company here that doesn't want to be here. But it also creates an opportunity for those insurance companies that are used to working with providers in a network. The opportunity that it provides for them is to help the provider, the doctors in the hospitals, be better at managing their risk within their system to help them do things that we know lowers co lower costs, like put into place electronic medical records, which we know lowers error, to help them put into place electronic claims reporting, which makes the system much more efficient, to help the doctors work together to find what, what we call the best practices or practice of medicine that's based on evidence that based on medical knowledge. There, there are many different ways that insurance companies can work in a collaborative relationship with doctors and hospitals to help the doctors and help hospitals organize into the type of networks that, that would be part of this plan. Some insurance companies won't want to do that. They simply aren't equipped to do it. They don't, they're not, that's not the part of their mission. Other insurance companies would find many opportunities. Do you believe that this has a good chance for becoming the law of the land in Wisconsin, or will the almost instant opposition from the Republican Party and from business organizations in some levels um, sink it? I absolutely believe that the answer to that question lies in the response of the people of the state of Wisconsin. This is not a special interest bill. It was never written as a special interest bill. It was written in response to the needs and the cries of the people. It will be the people that make the difference in whether or not this is passed. I can lead as a state legislator, and I want to lead very much, but I need to have the people follow me. I speak for the people, and it is not the special interest that will benefit from this bill. The people that now deny care to people will not benefit from this bill. These are the people that are lobbying very hard against it. If you read that almost in instantaneous opposition. It was opposition that came from people who now profit off of denying care to people. Those people will not be happy with any type of serious health care reform, but the people, the average business person, the school board administrator, the, the, the farmer, the small business body shop owner, the motel owner, these are the people that have called me, that have written, that have said over and over again, we need change, we need you to get this job done, we need you to get this job done now. And if it doesn't happen now, uh, can we just continue to get along the way the state has gotten along so far? No, I don't think so. And when we look at health care reform as it's being talked about in other states, we see systems that do not deal with the underlying problems, that don't deal with changing the way we handle either the money or the risk. And what, that's ha what has happened in other states, at least in some of the early, um, the, the early innovation that's out there, is the costs of rising. Until we get to the heart of what's causing rising costs, we cannot deal with the problem. But the suffering that is out there now, the concern over the rising costs, the, the unaffordability for business and school districts and county boards, city councils, is really forcing our hand as state legislators to say we will take the lead on this. We will provide an opportunity for, for people to, to give us input and to make real change happen, if, it, if not at the federal government, at the state government level. And if the state passes this and later on the federal government comes out with a plan that um, does the same thing, more or less, uh, what happens to the structures that are put into place to make this function here? Well, every, op every indication I have right now is that when innovation and change happens at the, st at the federal level, it's going to allow for innovation and change at the state level. So what we're looking at is a future where states become the incubators for good ideas. And a, an idea that worked in California simply might not work in Wisconsin, and an idea that worked in Massachusetts might, might not work in Alabama. 
So what, what I do hope that the federal government does is look at and learn from what's been done in, in the states before they move forward on the federal level. Obviously, from a legal standpoint, the federal government could preempt what's happening at the state level. But I, I do think it's wise, and it, and it was wise when we originally thought about ideas, is to look at what's happening in other places. And we studied other states. We studied what was happening around the world. We took the best ideas that were out there on the proposals here in the state of Wisconsin, and we came up with an idea that is uniquely Wisconsin, that uses our best structures, our, our absolutely a, a, a wonderful health care delivery system but provides access to all the people that need it now at the same time that we do away with the duplication, the administrative waste, the incredible paperwork that frustrates doctors and hospitals alike and helps to streamline the whole system so that it works much more efficiently than it does now. A couple of more questions. Uh, this um is this going to be an issue that divides people on a uh, party basis, Democrat versus Republican, and big business versus small business and employees? Well, I, I certainly hope not. Uh, Health care is, is really a bipartisan issue. It could be you or I tomorrow that ends up without insurance or with a chronic disease. There are some ideological concerns on both sides of the aisle, and it isn't always necessarily divided by party, sometimes it's divided by ideology. Even among the Democratic Party, uh, there are some people that are very pro-competition and other people that are very pro-regulation. What we tried to do in this plan was to, to put the ideological arguments uh, on one side, the regulation camp, on the other side, the competition camp, put those arguments aside and say, where regulation, where, where competition works, let's let it work. And where it works in this plan is at the level of those competing networks, the different HMO type organizations that provide care, provide choices to people. And where it doesn't work, then set the rules for the insurance companies that they have to play by the game, by, by these rules. And the types of rules we're talking about are that we cannot and should not deny care to, every, to anyone. We should not say that certain diseases are excluded. We should not say, yes, we'll cover you, but we're not going to cover your arm or we're not going to cover your asthma or we're not going to cover your diabetes. So what we've done is set rules in place to say that if you're going to play by the by the you play the game, you need to play by the rules. Now, when, when we do that, we, we have opposition on both sides. Some people say we haven't gone far enough. Some people say we've gone too far. I'd say, as a legislator, that's probably a good place to be. As a candidate, you were an advocate for health care reform, and now as a state senator, you continue to advocate for this proposal and for health care issues. Is this the kind of issue that could map your way to uh, uh, a escalating political career beyond the office you now hold? I've learned that we need to fight today's battles today, and this is a very big battle that we need to fight, and I need to fight it for the people that elected me. So when I think about where I am today and what I'm doing, I think about what today's battles are. I. I really don't think about where I'm going in the future. I think about what has to happen today. And what I know what has to happen today is that the, the needs of the people need to be put first. Far too long, the needs of the special interests have been put first in Madison. And I'm working very hard to change that. One thing I need to add, though, is um, one thing that this doesn't, at least on the surface, seem to address is lifestyle and uh, the fact that so many of us don't eat right, some of us smoke, some of us do other things that uh, endanger ourselves and other people and make the health costs higher. I absolutely agree. And, and that's critical to be able to figure out how we put in place a system that encourages healthy behavior. And there's a wide variety of ways that we can do that. And I'll give you just a few of the ideas that we've thought of. One is that we know that 20% of the people are responsible for 80% of health care costs. And most of those costs are associated with chronic disease, many of which have lifestyle components. 
So one of the strong um, factors that we used when we put together the plant was something that's just on the cusp of medical innovation, and that is the idea of chronic disease management, that people are encouraged to follow a particular program, whether it's for diabetes or asthma and or whether it's to stop smoking to help your asthma, whether it's to eat right and exercise for your diabetes. The, these programs we know are very effective. We're just beginning to get information on both cost and quality, but we do know from the preliminary work that, that the programs are very effective. And Wisconsin right here in, in Marshfield Clinic in Wisconsin has been an innovator in developing how these programs work, work on a practical patient level perspective. So one of the things we did in the plan was we provided no copayment or an incentive for people to participate in the chronic disease management programs so that they would have a financial reason in addition to a health reason to participate in the program, follow the doctor's advice, and do those healthy behaviors that, that we know save lives and save money. As a parish nurse, do you need to be in, involved in encouraging people to alter their lifestyle, uh, what they eat, what they may do as far as smoking and consuming uh, various amounts of alcohol. Uh, is that something that's a concern of yours? Oh, absolutely. Uh, that's probably the primary number one thing that would be the best thing I could do would be to educate the congregation on health concerns. And for them to have the knowledge that they need to take control of their lives is, is you know, very primarily most important. Um, hosted a lot of things like um, walking clinics where we walk together. We've had exercise classes here at church. We've had dietitians come to talk. We've had uh, lots of different forms, uh, different ways to educate the congregation and taking um, care of their own health. Why shouldn't a health care provider like yourself look at people who have no coverage from Badger Care or regular insurance or anything in between and say, I'm sorry, uh, I can't help you, good luck. Well, we take, I took, and many of us have taken the Hippocratic Oath, which is an ancient oath by this ancient Greek physician who uh, stipulated without any reservations that our duty was to relieve pain in the population we serve, no matter the cost, even if the cost uh, meant that we'd have to provide the uh, financial burden in addition to the time and the training that uh, we are, have in order to provide care. In addition, I, for instance, belong to an organization whose motto is to be worthy to serve the suffering. I simply can't ignore patients because uh, they can't pay. I have to do it, and I have been doing it all my life. Would you say the same principle applies to citizens who look at this proposal and say this can be expensive for me and my insurance needs are covered? Why should I be taxed more or de dig deeper into my pocket to help those who have not taken care of themselves? They have a legitimate concern and complaint, and uh, I agree with them. But the burden can be uh, evened out if we have a fair system. That particular group of patients that you mentioned who provide for their own insurance one way or the other are paying the premiums, as mentioned, to care for those uninsured. But that premium is a tax. If you change the definition of premium to tax and then enlarge the coverage by taxing everybody in the state equitably, that particular premium would be reduced significantly and the burden would then be more equitable for all of us. So far it appears that we have Democrats and on one side, especially in the Senate, and Republicans, especially in the House, on the other side, we have small business people and employees on one side and the big business manufacturers on the other side. Uh, is this going to be a partisan and divisive uh, issue uh, as far as maybe a, a, a class division 
uh, dispute and a partisan dispute? I think if that does happen, it will be incredibly unfortunate uh, because this isn't about class. It isn't about race. It's about treating everybody in an equal manner, and it's about recognizing that health care is not something that's a commodity like bread or or like shoelaces, that um, health care is something that's vital to people's well-being and happiness and their existence. And so therefore, we have to do something to make that equally accessible to every person in our state. So I truly hope that the Senate Democrats, the House Republicans, the large business owners, as well as the self-employed fellow down at the end of the street can all get together on the same page and decide that we need to do something and we need to do it soon. So how can we make this the best plan out there for everybody? Some seem to be convinced that this will lead the state to bankruptcy. I don't see it happening. I do think that doing nothing will lead a huge amount of our citizens and our businesses to bankruptcy. Um, I don't think we any longer have the option of not doing anything. Um, we truly are at a crisis point where people are dying and losing their life savings. Um, we have to do something. And I think that, that the Healthy Wisconsin proposal um, is a very good and creative proposal and it's it seems to have more teeth to it and more of an impact than um, some of the things I've seen that just kind of tinker around the edges and give one small population some help. What has to happen to make sure this does become a reality? Oh, I think in order for this to become a reality, uh, people have to call up their assembly representative and their senator. They're really, really easy to find. You can go on the Citizen Action of Wisconsin website. You can go on the state legislature website. There are a dozen different websites out there that will link you up with your senator and your assembly representative. Over the summer, into the fall, you see that assembly representative or that senator at the state fair or at your local, um, at church. Tell them you want health care reform. Tell them that you need this and that, um, you know, we've got to do something and we've got to do it quick. That is what's going to have the biggest impact on whether or not health care reform happens in Wisconsin. Do you believe that this is a plan that can have voter support and enough legislative support to become law? Those surveys, from my information, at least 80% 80, 80 of the citizens in Wisconsin and other states feel that the, some form of universal care is a necessity, so they would vote for it. The uh, Senate already has passed the Wisconsin plan, and but the uh, Republican or the Assembly, which uh, is uh, has the uh, the Assembly, which has the Republican majority, is going to vote it down. Apparently, including, for instance, the tax on cigarettes, which I mentioned is a cause of most of the uh, problems I see in the open door clinic. Uh, I testified at the Finance Committee to in favor of uh, increasing the tobacco tax to dollar twenty three cents from seventy seven, but they eliminated that from this their budget already. Despite the fact that, that during that uh, Finance Committee hearing, there was many more people, in addition to myself, that were in favor with, were in favor of the tax, including students who understand that tobacco is not, uh, ad, ad, understand that tobacco adversely affects everybody's health and those in the community as well. So I think that the general opinion, more than the sentiment, is for a universal care that covers everyone. When it comes to behaviors like smoking, you deal with people on a regular basis who know better whatever their level of education, they have been exposed for years to the information about the danger that cigarette smoking causes. Why do people keep on doing this knowing what it will do to them? 
I wish I could give you a definitive answer for that, but one certainly is the tobacco industry themselves and their advertisement throughout the years, the failure of the medical community throughout the first century and a half of America to recognize the uh, disease burden that tobacco causes until 1964. The failure of the medical profession themselves to give up smoking for many years until recently. The failure of hospitals themselves to make their campuses smoke free, for instance, in Chippewa Falls until only recently. So that they tacitly endorse smoking. Then there's the uh, influence of your constituents or your friends who smoke and urge you to do it at the very young level. Parents that smoke in the home so the children smoke. And uh, the cost of cigarettes or tobacco in general was minimal up until the last several years. And much of it, the increase is due to the tax rather than the production of the tobacco itself. So it's a uh, it's a, 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 a cultural phenomenon that's been present since uh, America, North American continent was uh, discovered, so-called, by the uh, Europeans that developed the tobacco habit. To, re to replace it completely is a real difficult problem. To influence an individual patient to give up smoking, although he knows or she knows that it's absolutely necessity, is a challenge we face all the time and requires considerable, rather harsh discipline in some times to get their attention. But uh, the cultural background and the lack of education, once again at the family and the elementary level, is the reason people continue to smoke. Unfortunately, there are currently more women that smoke in Wisconsin than men and up to 30% of pregnant females smoke, which is uh, a significant burden, I think, on brain metabolism. You perhaps have heard of fetal alcohol syndrome in children whose parents uh, both drink. Well, in parents, particularly mothers who smoke, certainly there must be an effect of the tobacco that crosses the placenta barrier and undoubtedly in influences development of very fragile nerve cells in the spinal cord and brain and probably reduces creativity and IQ in the developing fetus and eventually in the child that is born. So we need a lot more than money to fund health care. We need more public awareness, more individual awareness of lifestyle uh, changes and, and things that we continue to do to uh, harm ourselves? Well, just driving down from Chippewa to Eau Claire, I noticed the uh, advertisements for serve several different medical clinics. Now, if we would replace the competition in medicine on those big signs with something that says, don't please do not smoke, or tobacco is a hazard to your health, or alcohol causes fetal death and injury, we would uh, have a more productive outcome and lower the burden of uh, health care costs to, uh, to a percentage far greater than uh, ever before. It just uh, So we have to public awareness through television, through the newspapers, through the Internet, particularly the ads on the Internet when you're on browsing. It might be devoted to uh, health affairs rather than selling products. All those things would help. It would increase the general health of the United States physically and mentally. And perhaps then we could look at the general problems in the world and solve them with uh, a greater amount of, uh, greater number of people who are much smarter than they ever were before. Diet is more difficult to control, I guess, especially in this fast-paced lifestyle that m most of us live in, where um, lunch often is just driving through a window. Well, eating disorders is a is a general 
uh, epidemic. And of course, we have you know, there are so many places to eat: fast food, slow food, expensive food, cheap food. And most of the food that we've had, at least since the Second World War or since the Depression, has been fortified with vitamins. And you notice that, compared to myself, for instance, people are taller and heavier and oftentimes healthier, at least for a short period of their lives because of uh, the uh, developments in basic sciences, particularly vitamins and food additives, and the quality of production on our farm. But, uh, and, and food is cheap, so people eat them, eat, and they eat more. It also is a, uh, it's an antidote to stress. It, uh, it inter interrupts the day. It helps in camaraderie. There's never a meeting without food. It uh, surprises me that uh, the food provided at certain meetings or even a party are, is so elegant and so calorie loaded rather than, as you meant, salad. So uh, food itself is uh, ubiquitous, it's pleasant, it's available, and it's cheap. And what's going to be the uh, nuts and bolts of how this will work for those who have no coverage now? Maybe they work for a job that provides no insurance, or maybe they're unemployed, uh, these types of people. Well, the Healthy Wisconsin, your choice, your plan, provides care to those people who are in the middle, the people who are not eligible for any public program, whether it be Medicaid or Medicare. So a person that has no income at all or very, very low income would likely be eligible for Medicaid or Badger Care. So those people would be in the public program. They wouldn't be in the, in, in the Healthy Wisconsin program. But the people in the middle, the people that were not covered, they would have the same benefits that I have as a state legislator. They would have a choice of plans, which is the way it works for me as a state legislator. That choice would be unrelated to what to their particular job. So if they were in a job right now where the employer didn't pay into the system, that employer would have to pay into the system. But the, all of the people who are now employers buying insurance would no longer have to worry about negotiating with insurance companies. Instead, they would play, pay a rate based on a percent of payroll. For that employer, it would be 10.5% of payroll. For the worker, it would be 4% of payroll. This would be done through a payroll deduction. As I mentioned, it's not a tax. It's an assessment. It doesn't move into the state budget. It moves into the trust, and the trust then pays doctors and hospitals through the system similar to the way they're being paid now. Those people who are in jobs that are not now providing coverage are mostly people in low-wage jobs in both the service and retail industry. So what, what we would see is uh, the ability for these low-wage employers to provide health insurance at, at a much less cost than they have now. And for me, as a former farmer, I, I very much wanted to provide health insurance to my employees and, and to my family, but eventually for my family it became un, unaffordable. So what we would, many of those low-wage employers that are not now covering their employees would find that the insurance would be quite affordable. There have been some cases in other types of insurance where insurance companies didn't like the guidelines they had to operate under in certain states, and they just pulled out of those states. Could that happen as a result of this proposal for how they would operate for health insurance in Wisconsin? Certainly, absolutely. No one is keeping any company here that doesn't want to be here. But it also creates an opportunity for those insurance companies that are used to working with providers in a network. The opportunity that it provides for them is to help the provider, the doctors and the hospitals, be better at managing their risk within their system to help them do things that we know lowers lower costs, like put into place electronic medical records, which we know lowers error, to help them put into place electronic claims reporting, which makes the system much more efficient, to help the doctors work together to find what, what we call the best practices or practice of medicine that's based on evidence 
that based on medical knowledge. There, there are many different ways that insurance companies can work in a collaborative relationship with doctors and hospitals to help the doctors and help hospitals organize into the type of networks that, that would be part of this plan. Some insurance companies won't want to do that. They simply aren't equipped to do it. They don't, they're not, that's not the part of their mission. Other insurance companies would find many opportunities. Do you believe that this has a good chance for becoming the law of the land in Wisconsin, or will the almost instant opposition from the Republican Party and from business organizations in some levels um, sink it? I absolutely believe that the answer to that question lies in the response of the people of the state of Wisconsin. This is not a special interest bill. It was never written as a special interest bill. It was written in response to the needs and the cries of the people. It will be the people that make the difference in whether or not this is passed. I can lead as a state legislator, and I want to lead very much, but I need to have the people follow me. I speak for the people, and it is not the special interests that will benefit from this bill. The people that now deny care to people will not benefit from this bill. These are the people that are lobbying very hard against it. If you read that almost in instantaneous opposition. It was opposition that came from people who now profit off of denying care to people. Those people will not be happy with any type of serious health care reform, but the people, the average business person, the school board administrator, the, the, the farmer, the small business body shop owner, the motel owner, these are the people that have called me, that have written, that have said over and over again, we need change, we need you to get this job done, we need you to get this job done now. And if it doesn't happen now, uh, can we just continue to get along the way the state has gotten along so far? No, I don't think so. And when we look at health care reform as it's being talked about in other states, we see systems that do not deal with underlying problems, that don't deal with changing the way we handle either the money or the risk. And what that's ha what has happened in other states, at least in some of the early, um, the, the early innovation that's out there, is the costs of rising. Until we get to the heart of what's causing rising costs, we cannot deal with the problem. But the suffering that is out there now, the concern over the rising costs, the the unaffordability for business and school districts and county boards, city councils, is really forcing our hand as state legislators to say we will take a lead on this. We will provide an opportunity for, for people to, to give us input and to make real change happen, if, it, if not at the federal government, at the state government level. And if the state passes this and later on the federal government comes out with a plan that um, does the same thing more or less, uh, what happens to the structures that are put into place to make this function here? Well, every, op every indication I have right now is that when innovation and change happens at the, st at the federal level, it's going to allow for innovation and change at the state level. So what we're looking at is a future where states become the incubators for good ideas. And a st an idea that worked in California simply might not work in Wisconsin, and an idea that worked in Massachusetts might, n might not work in Alabama. So what, what I do hope that the federal government does is look at and learn from what's been done in, in the states before they move forward on the federal level. Obviously, from a legal standpoint, the federal government could preempt what's happening at the state level. But I, I do think it's wise, and it, and it was wise when we originally thought about ideas, is to look at what's happening in other places. And we studied other states. We studied what was happening around the world. We took the best ideas that were out there on the proposals here in the state of Wisconsin, and we came up with an idea that is uniquely Wisconsin, that uses our best structures, our, our absolutely a, a, a wonderful health care delivery system, but provides access to all the people that need it now at the same time that we do away with the duplication, the administrative waste, the incredible paperwork that frustrates doctors and hospitals alike, and helps to streamline the whole system so that it works much more efficiently than it does now. A couple of more questions. Uh, this um is this going to be an issue that divides people on a uh, party basis, Democrat versus Republican, and big business versus small business and employees? 
Well, I, I certainly hope not. Health care is, is really a bipartisan issue. It could be you or I tomorrow that ends up without insurance or with a chronic disease. There are some ideological concerns on both sides of the aisle, and it isn't always necessarily divided by party. Sometimes it's divided by ideology, even among the Democratic Party. Uh, there are some people that are very pro-competition and other people that are very pro-regulation. What we tried to do in this plan was to, to put the ideological arguments uh, on one side, the regulation camp, on the other side, the competition camp, put those arguments aside and say, where regulation, where, where competition works, let's let it work. And where it works in this plan is at the level of those competing networks, the different HMO type organizations that provide care, provide choices to people. And where it doesn't work, then set the rules for the insurance companies that they have to play by the game, by, by these rules. And the types of rules we're talking about are that we cannot and should not deny care to, every, to anyone. We should not say that certain diseases are excluded. We should not say, yes, we'll cover you, but we're not going to cover your arm or we're not going to cover your asthma or we're not going to cover your diabetes. So what we've done is set rules in place to say that if you're going to play by the by the you play the game, you need to play by the rules. Now, when, when we do that, we, we have opposition on both sides. Some people say we haven't gone far enough. Some people say we've gone too far. I'd say, as a legislator, that's probably a good place to be. Well, I don't think the State, state Senate Democrats' plan um, will end up in the final version of the package. Um, I know that the Assembly Republicans uh, at the conference committee table um, are not going to accept that. Uh, at least we're fighting it right now. I can't say exactly what's going to happen, but um, I would urge individuals, if they're concerned about the government taking over their health care and a new 14.9% payroll tax to the tune of $15.2 billion per year, again, that's the floor, not the ceiling, I would urge them to contact their legislators. If they want illegal immigrants covered in this socialized medicine plan, you know, I guess they should weigh in on it, but I believe many people are concerned that this cost will only go up Having the government run their health care will only reduce access and reduce quality. And uh, I, I think the debate will continue. I am hopeful that this will not end up in the final budget because, again, we have a $58 billion state budget every two years. Um, to raise taxes by another $15.2 billion on top of all the other taxes we pay to try this scheme, um, which would let government take over all of the health care in the state of Wisconsin, I believe is very risky very dangerous, and uh, I just don't believe it's what most people uh, expect their legislators to be doing. Some of the advocates suggest that we're already indirectly paying for illegal aliens now through uh, assistance that is already available. Well, and, and that is a problem, and I think we do need reform. I, I, there is absolutely no reason that I believe badger care should cover illegal aliens. I believe we should cover children in emergency care. Uh, I'm not asking or I'm not advocating denying care to anyone. Um, but there's no reason why um, someone who is paying their health insurance uh, should be last in line and illegal immigrants in some cases should be first in line. That makes no sense to me whatsoever. But I can tell you in reading the, so the universal health care scheme concocted by the state senate democrats, Illegal aliens are clearly covered. All you have to be is a resident of the state of Wisconsin. That's it. As a candidate, you were an advocate for health care reform, and now as a state senator, you continue to advocate for this proposal and for health care issues. Is this the kind of issue that could map your way to uh, uh, a escalating political career beyond the office you now hold? I've learned that we need to fight today's battles today, and this is a very big battle that we need to fight, and I need to fight it for the people that elected me. So when I think about where I am today and what I'm doing, I think about what today's battles are. I, I really don't think about where I'm going in the future. I think about what has to happen today, and what I know what has to happen today is that the, the needs of the people need to be put first. Far too long, the needs of the special interests have been put first in Madison, and I'm working very hard to change that. One thing I need to add, though, is um, one thing that this doesn't, at least on the surface, seem to address is lifestyle 
and uh, the fact that so many of us don't eat right, some of us smoke, some of us do other things that uh, endanger ourselves and other people and make the health costs higher. I absolutely agree, and, and that's critical to be able to figure out how we put in place a system that encourages healthy behavior, and there's a wide variety of ways that we can do that. And I'll give you just a few of the ideas that we've thought of. One is that we know that 20% of the people are responsible for 80% of health care costs. And most of those costs are associated with chronic disease, many of which have lifestyle components. So one of the strong um, factors that we used when we put together the plan was something that's just on the cusp of medical innovation, and that is the idea of chronic disease management, that people are encouraged to follow a particular program, whether it's for diabetes or asthma, and or whether it's to stop smoking to help your asthma, whether it's to eat right and exercise for your diabetes. The, these programs we know are very effective. We're just beginning to get information on both cost and quality, but we do know from the preliminary work that, that the programs are very effective. And Wisconsin right here in, in Marshville Clinic in Wisconsin has been an innovator in developing how these programs would work on a practical patient level perspective. So one of the things we did in the plan was we provided no copayment or an incentive for people to participate in the chronic disease management programs so that they would have a financial reason in addition to a health reason to participate in the program, follow the doctor's advice, and do those healthy behaviors that, that we know save lives and save money. Some people paint this as a struggle between those who care and those who are profiteering from the system the way it is now. Well, um, look, I, you know, we have a quality health care system in Wisconsin. We cover roughly 93 or 94 percent um, of all individuals. All individuals in Wisconsin have um, that coverage. So about 94 percent of people have um, coverage. There are some who choose not to have coverage. There are some um, who, uh, you know, simply for whatever reason have coverage during certain parts of the year, but not other parts of the year. Um, so I think we're doing pretty well in terms of coverage in the state in comparison with other states. Well, I, as I say, I want to make sure we get something done. And I'm pleased that we're having this big debate. But what I'm focused on in this budget is getting our kids insured and getting hardworking families uh, access to affordable insurance. The discussion will continue by citizens, health care professionals, and political leaders as to whether or not to reform health care in the state and if so, how to go about doing it.